So if you've been with us, we've been journeying through the Old Testament and looking at some of these characters, these patriarchs of faith, and this morning we will get to Gideon. So Gideon uh, is the character of study. It's going to take me about 10 minutes to get there, so um, <laughs> just kind of warning you. Gideon is a great story, though, I promise. <laughs> we'll get there, but no, Gideon is this story of this guy who becomes uh, this great warrior. He is... Uh, he starts off hiding uh, from the Midianites in a cave, basically, and he goes on to lead um, an army of Israel to a great victory. And it's amazing what uh, we become um, as we walk with the Lord. So, you know, I want you to know your Bibles. That's one of the reasons as elders that we wanted to take some time to uh, go through the Old Testament. It's a good thing for you to know your Old Testament, and especially um, the different characters and the big picture of it. So last week we looked at Joshua. Joshua is a great leader. And he's a great leader, not so much, I don't think, because of natural talent. I'm sure there was some there, but primarily because he was obedient to the Lord. His story ends with him saying, you know what, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And we saw Joshua lead the people of Israel, into the promised land. Uh, he was the successor of Moses. And, you know, the sort of the storyline of the Old Testament is that God, you know, we saw in the beginning, he creates man in his image. And from there, we see the population of the earth, the command to be fruitful and multiply. Then we see at, uh, Abraham. He's the father of our faith. Through Abraham... Uh, there's this covenant that God is going to establish a nation. And Abraham is the father of us of faith. He's the father of Israel. Um, but also you and I as New Testament believers, we've been grafted into that plan of Israel. And Abraham, through his offspring, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, Jacob has 12 sons. Those 12 sons become the tribes of Israel. And we saw also Joseph was one of those sons. And through this wild ride of Joseph, we see God's providence at work bringing the people of Israel to the land of Egypt. And through his story, we see that, you know, a lot of times the sufferings, the trials that we go through are not outside of God's plan. That God works his providence out even when people sin against us. We saw that through the life of Joseph. So Joseph brings the people to Israel, of Israel to Egypt. And for a time, period of 400 years, they're in Egypt, growing as a nation, and they begin to suffer, and they're crying out. They, they become slaves in Egypt. People of God are crying out for a deliverer, and God loves his people, and he raises up Moses as a deliverer. And we looked at the life of Moses, and at 80 years old, Moses finally is prepared by God to take on this leadership task to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt and a great miraculous story many plagues and uh, it's a it's an amazing miracle where Moses goes through the Red Sea right and leads the people of Israel into the wilderness where the people of God wander through the wilderness for 40 years and during this time in the wilderness God makes a covenant with his people and God is uh, a God who loves people that's one of these cohesive, big picture ideas of the Bible. You don't want to miss that. The whole Bible is held together and it's one big cohesive story. God loves people. And you know, it's amazing to think that in the book of Genesis, the beauty of the stars, you go outside, you look at the sun, moon, and stars, and it's like, how glorious is that? There's one chapter given to the sun, moon, and stars, and there's 66 books given to this relationship between God and man. And he desires to have a covenant relationship with his people and you know as the people of, of God are in the wilderness he establishes this mosaic covenant or this old covenant it's a conditional covenant that if you obey the Lord and you follow him and you worship him you'll be blessed but if you abandon the Lord and you worship false gods you'll be cursed that is this conditional covenant of the old testament and we see that God establishes this covenant, this, you know, the 
we, we think of the, the stone tablets where he writes these Ten Commandments and he gives them to Moses. And, and there's also a promise of the land. And Moses is wandering in the wilderness towards the promised land, this land of Canaan or the land of Israel. But Moses and the, that generation, all except for Joshua and Caleb, they die off. And it's Joshua with his generation of people that leads that goes into this promised land. We saw that last week. There's this miraculous, another parting of water, except this time the leaders, they have to get their feet wet. And it's amazing to see. They, once they step into the Jordan, the rivers of the Jordan part, and they cross into this promised land. But there's always these leaders that God raise, raises up in the, in the Bible, and there's these deliverers. You know, there's these... Uh, types of Christ and we don't want to lose sight of the the new covenant uh, idea that we are a part of you and I you know all of these leaders point to one who would come who is Jesus the Messiah we look back on the Old Testament and like Gideon today for example is a type of Christ because he delivered the people of Israel out of oppression Jesus has delivered you and set you free from the enemy that is Satan and sin. So we don't want to lose sight of that. But there are these cycles that happen in the Old Testament. There are, you know, these periods where we see the the manifestation of the Old Covenant come to life. God promises, if you you will obey me, you'll be blessed. If you disobey me, you'll be cursed. And you and I as New Covenant believers, ultimately Jesus became a curse for us. So don't lose sight of that as we go through here in some of this. But notice with me, look at Judges chapter 2. This book of Judges is in this period of time between Joshua and Israel's first king. One of the key ideas that's constantly said many times throughout Judges is it was a period of time where Israel had no king and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. That's exactly the day that we're living in right now. I don't know if you realize that. Everybody's doing, they're not worried about what God says is right. They're doing what's right in their own eyes. And I know, hope all of you that here this morning, you're wanting to do what's right in God's eyes. But when a nation begins to do what's right in their own eyes, It falls apart. And there's these cycles of distress that Israel finds themselves in because they abandon God. There's these consequences. Judges shows the consequences of rebellion against God. It shows that God's word comes true. God said you'll be blessed if you obey the Lord, but you'll be cursed if you disobey. And Judges shows those cycles. And look at, that's where we're at here. Look at Judges verse Uh, chapter 2 verse 6 when Joshua dismissed the people the people of Israel went to each to his inheritance to take possession of the land we would call that the land of Canaan or uh, Israel and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel and Joshua the son of Nun the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And all that generation, this is verse 10, jump down to verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord and the work that Israel, uh, that he had done for Israel. It's amazing to think that one generation can pass and not know anything about the Lord? It doesn't even seem possible, does it? But I mean, it it reminds us the calling we have to pass on the faith to the next generation. I mean, it's almost like Joshua's grandkids did not know anything about the God of Israel. It's so important to pass it along, especially as we get older, pass along the faith to the next generation. Keep going here, Judges Uh, 2 verse 11 and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals those are false gods and they abandoned the Lord the God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt 
They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them. And they bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. Verse 13, they abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies. So that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm. As the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were in terrible distress. So one of the aspects of Judges is this manifestation of the old covenant. It says, as the Lord had promised. It's laid out in the Torah. If you obey my voice, you'll have safety from your enemies. You'll be able to live in freedom. But if you serve and begin to serve the false gods and you abandon the Lord, you'll be cursed. Your enemies will attack you and take control over you. So that's what we see here. They abandon the Lord. They do what we would call, they whore themselves out. They commit spiritual adultery. It's amazing how, and that's sort of the cycle that we see with Israel. They are the harlot. They're called the harlot. And, you know, all throughout here, even here, God's saying, you know, it's amazing that God continues to take them back. Like God is pictured as this groom and his bride is unfaithful. It's one of the things we see. We see that God is going to continue to care for them. You know, this message is for us. Even when we are in our distress of sin, we cry out to a deliverer, and his name is Jesus. Maybe you're in distress this morning. Jesus is the only one who can deliver us. But what we see here is Israel has abandoned the Lord and finds themselves in a place of distress. And the Lord raises up judges. Look back at, at Judges 2. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. This idea of spiritual adultery is something, even as New Testament believers, the Bible speaks of this. God is a jealous God. He loves you. He's created you to love him most of all. So when we begin to love the gods of this world, whether hedonism, materialism, whatever it is, we're considered to be whoring ourselves. I know it's graphic language, right? We essentially commit spiritual adultery and prostitute ourselves with false gods. God's created you to love him. And God is a jealous God in a godly way, a godly jealousy. He longs for your love, and when you abandon him, he goes after you. It's one of the fascinating things about our God. He doesn't just leave you in your adultery. He doesn't let you wander off. He actually goes and continues to love you despite what many husbands uh, would do, right? Just kick him to the curb. God is a faithful husband even when we are unfaithful, even when his people are unfaithful. Look at the middle half of 17. It says they soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, uh, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved him from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who had afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them, They did not drop any of the practices or their stubborn ways. It's amazing this cycle, this cycle that we see. It's very, I tried to put it on a little bit of a chart here. I mean, but this is basically the cycle of the Old Testament, the people of God. You have a time of peace. Even even think of Joshua, for example. Joshua, he's serving the Lord. He leaves this generation with, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And there's a time of peace. But during the time of peace, when things are going well, that's when the people of God, I don't know if it's because they just start drinking too much or partying too much, things are going amazing. And they start to rebel against the Lord. They forget the Lord. They abandon the ways of the Lord. And what happens, the cycle is that there's consequences to their action. And there's oppression. The consequences 
you know, we reap what we sow, the consequences, however they work themselves out with God's sovereignty, God allows oppression to happen, oppression from the enemy. They lose their freedom because enemies begin to oppress them. And then they find themselves at rock bottom, crying out, why this distress? Why, why am I going through this distress? Sometimes people are even born in the, the nation at that dead low place where they're, you know, I thought God was good. Why is this happening? You know, like, and then they begin to cry out for a deliverer. And the cycle is that God brings a deliverer. And this is like, this is the book of Judges. Twelve times God raises up twelve different uh, mentioned judges or deliverers, leaders, who delivers them. And then they are delivered and say, wow, it's a, it's a time of peace again. <laughs> it's amazing. Things are so good. God is so good. But then they forget the Lord again. They abandon the ways of the Lord. When times are good, I mean, maybe it's a fresh challenge for us. But if times are good right now, don't neglect our time in the Word, right? Don't neglect our walk with the Lord. I mean, God does the same thing in a New Testament sense because, you know, with discipline, maybe not it's, it's not cursing. He's not, we're not cursed because of Jesus was cursed for us, but he still wants us back. He still allows us to be disciplined by the Lord. You know, uh, every child undergoes discipline. But this is the cycle. And 12 times through the book, book of Judges, you have these deliverers. Some of the judges, for example, and are Ehud. I've always liked Ehud. His story is in chapter 3. He was a left-handed warrior. <laughs> it's not really a story for kids, but he's, you know... It's more like rated R. He very graphic stabs, you know, the king Eglon, and his, sto- his sword gets lodged in there, and they think he's relieving himself, and he sits there for two days until they find him dead. Very good story. Uh, <clears throat> Deborah is another one. <laughs> Deborah is an amazing judge. Like Barak at the time was supposed to be the leader, but Barak was too cowardly, and he's like, okay. And Deborah's like, okay, well I'll go with you. And De- Deborah stands up as this amazing leader that delivers the people of Israel, and she gets the credit for this victory. And awesome story of how, you know, there's this victory over the Canaanite king of Jabin. Samson's pretty notable. I think most of us know Samson, right? He's, he was one of these judges. He was a leader who, he definitely delivered them in a military sense, but he struggled like crazy with the flesh and uh, sexual sin and the lust of his eyes. You could say, and he delivers the people of Israel from Philistine, but he ends up, you know, it's sort of a tragedy. His eyes gouged out, working like a slave. You know the story, he pushes over the pillars, and he wins the victory, but it's like, that was a mess. You know, it's like, he was one of those deliverers. But the one specifically we're going to look at today is Gideon. Gideon was a judge. Don't be thrown off by the word judge, not a judge in the Supreme Court sense, but a leader, military and civil leader. His story is fascinating. We'll go to Judges 6. Judge, uh, Gideon became so much more, you know, there's, some, there's a theme here. He becomes something, and it's really awesome to see how God allows this man who is weak and hiding and afraid to become the sort of leader and warrior that he became and get the people of God to a place of freedom. But notice chapter 6 of Judges, verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel... Because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and Amalekites and the people of these would come against them. They would steal it. Because God's trying to get their attention. He's allowing the enemy to take away their freedom. And then in verse 6, And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out to help to the Lord. Cried out for help to the Lord. I mean, there's that cycle again, right? They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The enemy takes over. And now they're at this place where they're crying out to God for deliverance again. And God is going to raise up Gideon. Gideon is a type of Christ who delivers us 
from our enemies. Don't forget that. But it starts here with people crying out to God for help. If we want to say it like this, I'm going to give you eight big points over the next 20 minutes. Becoming, becoming more starts here. Number, number one is making that initial commitment to God to live for him. You know, it's like it goes back to this moment of Joshua. Like, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, you may have been coming to church for a couple of months or a couple of weeks. Maybe you're still seeking the Lord. The first step is believe, right? Believe in Jesus. For us, it's Jesus. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He resurrected. And he calls you to receive him, to receive Jesus, and to make an initial commitment. Say, yes, I'm going to live for Jesus and not myself. You cannot see God do anything in your life. You cannot become the person God wants you to be without saying yes, right? Like that's the first step. From our perspective, it's yes, I want to follow Jesus. And, you know, in a practical sense, you believe and the first step is baptism. We make it very easy for you. Sign up for baptism. I'm sure we're going to have one in the next couple of months. But you sign up for that and you tell the world and you make this public acknowledgement that I'm no longer living for myself, I'm living for Jesus, the one who loves me and died for me and now I'm going to live for him. And you're, you're making this initial commitment that I want to follow Christ. And we're seeing here out of these Old Testament stories, they're repenting, right? And that's what God calls us to is to repent from our sins because we're enslaved by our enemy which is the flesh which is Satan which is sin and we repent of those things and we start this new life saying yes to following Jesus so it starts there I'll go on to verse 11 of chapter 6 now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Oprah which belonged to Joash the Abazirite which while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide from the Midianites. So you can see how bad things had gotten for Gideon. He's hiding in a wine press trying to uh, thresh out the wheat. Now, I don't know the last time you threshed out wheat. Anybody? Anybody know what that is? So threshing out wheat, actually I just saw some people doing this in East Africa, but you, take, you have to be out in the open fields, you take the wheat with sort of a pitchfork, you throw it up in the air, and the wind blows away the chaff. And you have uh, the good part of the wheat, the kernels left over. So here Gideon is, he's hiding for his life, trying to thresh wheat in a cave basically, that's how afraid he is for his life. He's hiding in fear of the enemy. But God has so much more for Gideon. It's amazing to think. And that's really the second point here this morning. Is that our journey towards fulfilling God's intentions begins at different points for us. You know, sometimes the suffering in the hard times is because of the sins of others. Gideon is born in a time where the, the world has gone mad. I mean, everyone doing right which is with his own, in his own eyes, and he's like, how is this the world I was born into? And I think, you know, the, the raising kids now, you think this is not the same America that it was that I grew up in. You know, it's like, and sometimes, for whatever reason, people are born, everybody's race starts at a different place in history. Sometimes people are born when we're more enslaved economically. Sometimes it's more of a prosperous time. But listen, for you as the people of God, God has a plan for you. And you don't need to be groaning and hating the nation that you're born up in, grown, uh, born into. God has a plan for you, especially as a Christian person. God has a plan for you. We can't blame the perverted day that we find ourselves in. You're still called to raise a family. We don't just abandon having kids because of the corrupt world we live in. No, we, we're fruitful, we multiply, we raise our kids in the... Way, but it's going to be different for those kids. But we get up and we walk, right? We don't just have bitterness, resentment, and anger. We watch the news and just brush it off as hopeless. There's more. God wants us to become more. God wants this, this more to happen in this city. Go on here, verse 12 of Judges 6. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. (laughs) It is funny, isn't it? I think it's funny. It's funny because this guy's hiding for his life, and the angel calls him a mighty man of valor. You know, many pastors would act like this angel is being sarcastic. And you got to wonder if there's sarcasm in heaven. I don't know. It seems like he's being sarcastic. But I think a better explanation is that this angel and that God sees Gideon not as who he is, but as the person he's going to become. That's the way God sees us. God doesn't see us as we, you know, are. He sees the finished product. That's the third point. You need to remember on becoming more for Christ and becoming growing in your faith. You know, God sees the finished work in you, not the current struggles. This is something you need to remind yourself of. You know, as we journey with God and or new Christians, maybe you're just committed your life to Christ and you're like, why am I struggling the way that I am? That, that's, that's the life. Like, you're going to struggle. There's this progressive journey and it's like, crazier than the stock market I mean it is ups and downs and it's you know and you're on this journey and there's struggles and you're going to mess up but listen God doesn't see you and just you know turn against you your first mess up he is he sees the finished work of Christ in you he even sees the the plans that he has for you just like he sees Gideon a mighty man of valor God knows what he's going to become over time God knows what you're going to become over time and it's the glorified self you're being changed into the likeness of Christ over time maybe you're you're struggling right now with calling yourself a failure listen you're not a failure like you're a child of God created in his image and you're struggling with sin and it's okay like listen it's okay repent get back up make things right with God and keep keep moving God sees the finished work in you Let's go on here in verse 13 of Judges 6. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if, it is, uh, if the Lord is with us, why then is all this happening to us? I know we've asked ourselves that question, right? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, uh, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? It's like, you know, he's got his Torah out. He's, he's got the first five books. He's reading it like, How is this even possible? We're the people of God. They've delivered us. Why is this happening? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us. He's seeing his situation as a God-forsaken moment. Like he's like, God has forsaken us. And he's given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? So Gideon is looking at this moment as this hopeless, God-forsaken moment. Maybe you're, you know, that's the way you see your marriage. Like, or that's the way you see this job of yours. Or that's, you know, we can't look at the times that we're in and the, the situation that we're in and think that it's, it's only because God hates me and to turn his back on me or I'm cursed. We don't always know why. For Gideon, it was the people before him that, you know, caused this moment of, Slavery. The fourth big idea, becoming more for God and, and realizes, uh, involving, uh, recognizing that even in dark times you're called to be a light. You know, there was more for Gideon to do. You know, and it's at the darkest moments where light shines the, the brightest and you're in a dark time. We're in a dark time in America where There are very few Christian people standing up for, you know, the truth of God's word. But that's what he's called you to do, right? Is to stand out, to stand up for Christ, and to be a light. Every one of our stories are different, right? We don't know all the specifics of how this works out within a city. You and I are not called to go take on the Midianites. You and I are called to take on the gates of hell, essentially, with the gospel. You and I have this commission to go into the world, into the city, and to reach people for Christ. The, the enemy that is, is Satan, we have this deliverer, Jesus, who delivers people from their slavery to sin and sets people free, and that's our mission. And we're, That's the light, and we are called to that light, and God does still have a plan. 
Like Philippians 2, for example, says, Do all things without grumbling, that you may be blameless, innocent children of God, uh, without blemish in a crooked and twisted generation, whom you shine as lights in the world, holding on to the word of truth. This is you, right? This is your battle. This is the battle that we have. Shine. Be a light. Don't just write it off as hopeless. Verse 15 of Judges 6. Let's keep going here. And he said to them, him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. (laughs) That's what he says. And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. You know, Gideon's here in a noble sense. He sees how weak he is compared to the calling on his life. And for whatever distress you're in, you have to acknowledge that you're too weak. Whatever it is, marriage, business, problems. Listen, number five, point number five. Becoming more, you got to know that God uses weak vessels for divine purposes. God chooses the foolish things of the world. And compared to his perfect wisdom, every one of us were foolish. We're weak. I don't care how strong physically you are in any kind of divine prerogative that God has, we are weak. The sort of spiritual battles that go on in family life, trying to, I mean, that's Satan's number one plan is destroy your family. Acknowledge how weak you are and cry out to the Lord for help. We are jars of clay, right? Like that's the idea of we're just jars of clay, like just ready to just crack, right? We're that weak, but in these jars of clay is the gold treasure of the gospel that we have. And that, you know, through weakness, his power is made perfect in weakness. God gets glory when you as a weak vessel cling to God and let him use you. Do you feel weak, right? It's okay. That's a great place to be. God can do something with that. God can change any person, any marriage. In our, as we start with that, start there. Weakness. Now jump down to verse 28. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down. First things first. <laughs> Let's tear down some altars. Let's tear down some false idols. The Asherah pole beside it was cut down. A bull was offered on the altar that had been built, and they said to one another, who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they, say, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. So what is the first thing that he does? He goes and tears down the idols. He deals with the idol worship in his own people before he ever begins to take on the enemy. You know, becoming more in our own lives, number six, Make the drastic changes needed to get, there's a typo, to make things right with God. I don't know what kind of drastic changes. I know for me, when I first came to Christ, I had to make some drastic changes. Not everybody has this experience with music, and I'm dating myself here, but I had to personally take my entire CD collection and get rid of it. (laughs) Like, that was... Music for me was like punk rock and anger and hatred and that fueled my demonic sort of view on life. And I had to throw that out. I had to make that drastic changes. Porn, you know, uh, drugs, smoking, cigarettes, all of these things, drastic changes. You know, I don't know what sort of drastic idols in your own life, but if we're going to become what God wants and we're going to become more in our walk with God. We need to repent of the idols, tear down the idols in our own house. Maybe it's your household that your changes need to be made. Maybe you've been living, you're saved now. Some people get saved, they're living with their girlfriend. Move out. Like that's sort of the first step. Get things right. You don't, that's not the way that Christians operate, right? We don't commit adultery. We get married and then have sex. Like that's a big thing. You know, it's one of the first things like, for the Gentiles, just stop sleeping around. Like, let's just work on that. Stop getting naked, you know? It's like, get married, and then, you know, it's like the first big one. Maybe it's putting yourself 
Don't put yourself in situations. Repent of some kind of financial ethic thing you're doing wrong. I don't know, whatever it is, demolish the idol. You're never going to become all that God wants for you until you repent and tear down the idols. You know, chapter 7 of Judges, let me just summarize this. Chapter 7, Israel's about to go to battle with Gideon as the leader. There's 32,000 people in the army. And God says, hey, if any of you are afraid, go home. 22,000 people said, you know what, I'm too afraid to go to battle. I'm going home. 22,000. So the army goes from 32,000 to 10,000 people. Then God says, that's still too many. 10,000 people, he says, okay, go down to the, the lake and drink and see who, you know, scholars debate on why, but see who drinks water with their hands and see who drinks and laps like a dog. Maybe it's because they were still on the lookout. So God dwi- you know, uh, whittles the army down to 300 people. Why did that happen? We don't know. But listen, point number seven this morning. I'm becoming more. Listen, God has to often uh, prune our lives for it to bear fruit that he intends. You know, I don't know how you apply this to your own life. Maybe you're a business leader and you need to fire someone. You need to let someone go. Sometimes we don't know, like, certain situations. Why did God take that away? How am I going to do this with... You know, why did that person leave? Why did so many people leave? How are we ever going to survive? God has better plans. God has different plans. God's going to get the glory. And God can do, like we saw last week, you know, one man routes a thousand when, you know, when God is with you, 300 men can do the work of 32,000 soldiers. Loss is not always a bad thing. Pruning causes things to become more fruitful. One more point this morning. Jump down to uh, verse 16 of chapter 7. Judges chapter 7, verse 16. He divided the 300 men into companies, three companies, and put trumpets in the hands of all of them, and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet and, I, and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of the camp. And all shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Verse 19, so Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, that's about midnight, uh, when they had just set the watch. And they blew their trumpets and smashed their jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew their trumpets and broke the jars they held in their left hand and the torches and the right hands and the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. Uh, They cried out and fled, and when they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army, and the army fled. The enemy killed themselves. They fought against each other, and the Lord did it. The Lord did it with his wisdom. One final point this morning is that becoming more requires divine wisdom to accomplish divine results. You know, maybe it's not Midian. Maybe it is, for whatever reason, I'm thinking about marriage. You need God. You need a breakthrough. You need the enemy defeated in your house. And you don't win that battle with anything other than divine wisdom. You know, in James chapter 3, I was teaching at Zeal this week in the school of ministry, and I was reminded of James chapter 3. It compares the two. Maybe you're still trying to fight the enemy's battle with worldly wisdom. You know, there's a comparison, worldly wisdom and divine wisdom. Worldly wisdom is demonic. It's filled with bitter envy, jealousy, hatred. The godly wisdom is from above. as peace and patience. Listen, you, need, you cannot fight this battle and you cannot defeat the enemy with worldly weapons, right? With worldly wisdom. So I don't know what God's speaking to you this morning. I don't know. We've said a lot, I know, but maybe 
But let's just bow our heads for a moment and search our hearts. Maybe there's some idol that you need to get rid of that you know that this has got to go. You know, make that commitment this morning. Maybe you've never committed your life to Christ. Let today be that day that you say yes. The gospel is making sense. Jesus died for you to set you free from sin and destruction. Now turn to him in your distress and believe, believe in the gospel. Start this relationship with Jesus. Maybe your household is just being ravaged by the enemy this morning. Cry out to him in your distress. God is able. God will come through. God will give you the wisdom. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're afraid to do what God's called you to do. Listen, the Lord is with you. God has many more things to do in you and through you. God, I pray for our church this morning, Lord, if there's anyone that's just beat down by the enemy this morning, Lord. We look to you to restore, to bring peace, freedom. Lord, we don't want to be a slave to the enemy, a slave to our flesh or to, the, or to sin. Maybe you're entangled with some sin this morning. You're free in Christ. Christ paid the price. He defeated the enemy. You're more than conquerors. Get back up. You're a child created in God's image, and you're free. So walk in that freedom. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us this morning. We love you so much. We thank you for the peace that's in this room, God. Strengthen us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand. We're gonna, I know we're running a little bit late, but we're going to sing one last song together. If you need to leave, feel free, but let's, uh, let's sing. sing one last song.
Uh, if you need prayer for any reason, we are available. But may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace and joy as you walk with him this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed.